So oh, I'm okay. Julie Gunkelman. <laughs> I'm Julie Gunkelman. Um, I teach at OCC. I'm president elect um, of Mishmatic. Mike, I cut you off. Sorry. That's okay. So I'm Mike <laughs> Pemberton. I teach at Lansing Community College and I'm the president of Mishmatic. Sam Bazzi, I teach at Henry Ford College, used to be community college in Dearborn, Michigan. And I am the secretary treasurer of Mishmatic. I'm Barbie Hogue. I also teach at Oakland Community College, different campus than Julie. And I am just a Mishmatic member. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say. I said, I have no, no, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I am we a Mishmatic member. That. Though, yeah. You guys, so we can I, totally I, change that. You guys I'm, are an active I'm, member. Very I'm active okay. member. Yeah. Yes, we can say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm Jennifer LaRose. I'm also at Henry Ford uh, College with Sam. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Mitchell. I teach at Eastern Michigan. I'm Brenda Shepard. I teach at Lake Michigan College. Nina, we're all introducing ourselves. Did you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I just didn't know where I was in the order. Oh. Um, <laughs> you always show up second in the screen, you know? So um, yeah, my name is Nina White. Um, I teach at University of Michigan and I've attended the Mishmatic conference in the past a couple times. And um, yeah, I, uh, I have only negative experience with discussion boards. So I was really interested in positive experiences with discussion boards. You're probably in good company. Um, Barbara and I talked about this, I think last week. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just glad that everyone can, can actually come to the webinar. This, I mean, we, this is really for, for Barbie because Barbie actually requests a discussion, discussion boards. And I also thought, well, why don't we also have the student engagement in, involved in, in the webinar as well? So for me, I'm just going to actually listen a lot because if there is one aspect of my online class that I know, it's, it's that I don't use discussion boards very well and that my student engagement this semester I wish was a lot better, was much more, I wanted the students to be more involved, but it just, it was difficult this semester. So I just like to hear first, how, how have you gotten your students engaged in your, like in your online course, whether you're teaching remotely or asynchronously or synchronously? I know that Sam's been using discussion boards all semester. Sorry to put you on the spot, Sam. Well, uh, I can say something about engagement first, because my experience with the discussion board, so just to make you feel good, uh, Michael, hasn't been that great. And not only during COVID-19. I've been teaching online since 2002 or 2003, and I cannot say that my experience, you know, just came to be and, you know, just perfect or positive with discussion uh, boards. Unless if you make it 60 or 70 percent of the grade, probably things, you know, just will change. But as far as engagement, I want to thank, first of all, my colleague, you know, Jennifer LaRose, you know, at a meeting last summer, she suggested an app. It's called Socrative for uh, students. And I've been using, you know, just this app for engagement on every time basis, you know, just I meet with the students. I prepare activities and the students, you know, just would have, you know, just to do the activity in order to do two things. First of all, they get the grade for participation and uh, for attendance as well. So I've been using, you know, just this app in order, you know, just to keep track of attendance and to check on students' progress, you know, just in the classroom. I do prepare like, you know, several questions. I run some of them at the beginning of the lesson and then the rest in mid-lesson and toward the end, you know, just uh, of the lesson. So as far as engagement, this is a, probably the most effective way for me, silent engagement. I would call it, you know, just silent engagement, but students would have, you know, to do, uh, to do the work. As far as, you know, just verbal engagement, you know, in the classroom, unfortunately, I have only four or five students who are always, you know, the ones who participate and answer questions, you know, just during the lesson. But the Socrative, because it is graded, I managed to get almost, you know, just 100% of students, you know, to participate in this uh, 
uh, activity. It has worked well for me. It takes a lot of time, you know, to prepare uh, the question. It doesn't have a built-in, you know, system where you can select the questions. You have to create everything from scratch. But uh, it has worked, and I will continue to use it, you know, just next semester as well. Now, as far as discussion board, you know, the... Uh, I've been trying, you know, just different things, you know, just with the discussion boards. I mean, this year it got slightly better because I changed, you know, the percentage from like usually seven, eight percent to probably I think it's 10 or 12 percent of the grade. So students, you know, just are inclined, you know, just more, you know, just to participate. Although, you know, just my I mean, I, I feel like this area is the easiest area for students, you know, just to get, you know, just free points. You just go and answer questions or post a question. I don't understand why it is, you know, just that that kind, you know, just an obstacle, you know, for students. I, I feel like students just take it lightly. They don't think it's a big deal. They don't, they're not aware of what the syllabus says. And uh, although it is, you know, just 10% of the grade, you know, just is, is not nothing. So I've been, I've, I mean, I've been having, you know, just issues with that. You know, my experience hasn't been that great. I used to require students, you know, just to post their own questions and answer each other. That didn't work well. Now I do my own questions, but the system that we use would allow me, you know, uh, to set it up so students cannot see other students, you know, responses before they post, you know, their own response. So this way I can ensure that students are not going there and copying and pasting, you know, each other's work. I, heard that, I mean, you're having discussion boards, is it like 10, you're saying 10%, Sam? 10% of the grade. It, I think it's probably 12, I don't remember, but at least 10. I've heard some instructors are going up to like 20% or 25% this semester just because they want to have students engaged. I think it's awfully high, but I don't, I, I don't know. I've, I've struggled with that personally of how much, I mean, you have to give some credit because the students won't do it otherwise, but how much is too much to have it be not, con, not, not necessarily content based for the course grade, like, do you have questions? Do you all, do any of you all have discussion board questions that actually are like related to the topic of that week for the students? Or is it just mostly like general questions of, or uh, having like, in, like asking students if they have any questions and then they just post it in the discussion board only? Yeah. Michael, for me, they're related, you know, to the topics. In math, I see it's working well for general topics. You know, I, I will go to, I attend, you know, just, you know, uh, webinars and sessions, you know, just, and people, you know, just are brazing the way they're running discussion. But, but it's, it's different topics, you know, just from math, you know. The, you, there are some interesting, you know, subjects that you can bring up and students can have, you know, just some interesting input. But when it comes to us, you know, just in math, if students, you know, need to learn how to test the hypothesis, they need to learn how to test the hypothesis. I don't know how interesting, you know, I can make it. I put applications, I put some interesting, you know, just word problems there to trigger, you know, just their uh, interest. But for me, it has been always, except, you know, for the first week, you know, discussion board where students introduce themselves and uh, say you know why they're taking the course etc but after week one you know it's all 100 percent you know topic related for me one thing i tried that my learning management system um so so i mostly teach synchronously but i did one week of asynchronous teaching this past semester and so normally in my synchronous class it's all kind of small group work collaborative worksheets and so I was trying to emulate that with discussion boards so one thing I tried was having small group discussion boards so instead of having a discussion board for the whole class I split the students into groups and each group had a different discussion board but it was really onerous to try to look at all of those different discussion boards and also I just felt like in comparison to synchronous like misconceptions that came up, like I couldn't address them in real time. And I'm still finding that things from that one week, you know, my, my last day of class was yesterday. There's still things coming up from that one week where I'm like, oh yeah, it's that week. They just didn't learn as well from that week as they did from the synchronous 
um, classes. And so it was, it was a poor substitute for like actually being able to interact with each other and also for me to be able to give them immediate feedback. So that, that was hard. Like, I just don't, asynchronous teaching seems really hard to me. I'm very admiring of any of you who are doing asynchronous teaching. It seems really challenging. Yeah, I find the asynchronous hard as well. Um, I tried in the summer um, discussion boards for my, for groups. What made me trigger was that you said groups and I had some group projects. I know that's totally insane to do in this environment, but it actually has been working in my quantitative reasoning class. Um, but I had them uh, keep track, like what is the project about? Um, who's going to do what? That kind of thing. And to try to have them post it was a train wreck. It was like, I thought, well, they can all see it. It'll be easy, whatever. It was a disaster. I went to just turn in a Word document and have the paragraph. This is what the project is about. This is what we're trying to find. And then the next week I have them turn in. This is what we decided to do. Who's going to do what? And just to try to make them a little bit accountable, I give them a little bit of points for it. But that assignment has worked better as like a group assignment than it did on the discussion board. Um, I tried when I went into groups, because I do a lot of synchronous teaching, to say, hey, what's been going on in your group? It, they, they don't have time for that. It's, it's like a extra, it's a wasted step, right? So I've been doing a, a lot of what Sam has been doing, although I don't use the Socrative as much anymore. Sorry. Um, I really was big into AnswerPad, but now I've kind of morphed the Desmos activities to be my student response system. So you can make anything you you want in there. And so instead of using it to teach a lesson, I'm just kind of getting feedback. Like, what did you get for this problem? What do you think about, you know, these problems? Can you select all the things that are true about this particular function or whatever it is so that I can kind of hear what's going on in their small groups? So I do put them in breakout rooms, give them one of these. And then that's kind of, you know, my ears of what's going on inside those smaller groups. So in those lessons, Julie, is like every group working on one Desmos activity at a time? Or is um, it the group? I, I have everybody log in because I do a lot of personal check-ins. And um, then I, I learned at the AMATIC conference, I couldn't understand why you'd want to anonymize the, the students. Well, if you anonymize them, then when they share their answers, they're not going to feel bad if they got it wrong. So um, if you have the students share their answer, they see three other students' um, mm -hmm. answers. So um, that has actually been working out good. The students really like that because then they can see, hey, did I get something? If it's not just in my group, then it's like, it's almost like you're eavesdropping to the group at the next table, right? Oh, they got the same thing we did. All right. <laughs> you know, kind of, kind of thing. It's been, it's been working out very well. I've never used answer pad. What is that? Um, it's like Socrative on steroids. So it's got a lot more choices. So it's not just like multiple choice and true, false, and the short answer. You can actually have them um, do a drawing. So you can have them sketch a graph. Like I have them do it on their phone. I, I, I've done it um, live as well. Just you can kind of sketch a graph on there. Um, there's a Likert scale. Um, I'm trying to think what else is in there. What else I might use. The, the multiple choice, you can kind of do like so credit, you can have different amounts, like you can have three, four or five choices. Um, I'm trying to think, what else have I used that for? I don't know. I, as I've been using the Desmos so much now that I haven't even been thinking about AnswerPad. Although like if, if people are confused and I don't know what they're, they're doing, I will turn to that still. And because that can be just done on the fly. I don't have to make anything ahead of time. You can just say, hey, you know, what, what do you think about this? And then you can kind of drill down and figure out what they're, what they're thinking. And, and Julie, is there a cost to students for using answer pad? Nope. Nope. I still use the, well, I might have a, um, I'm one of their little ambassadors cause I used it a lot and I've, I've talked about it a lot, but, um, they, uh, students, it's free, um, for them to use. I don't, they don't have any, there's no requirement for that. Um, I might have a few extra little features, like for example, I can save a graph and then um, send it out to them and they can draw on top of it. I don't know if everyone can do that or not, but I mean, there's still a blank grid that they have for you to, to send out a graph. They can, you can do that. 
Um, you can also take a student's answer if it's good. And so sometimes I am the good student so that if the, all the graphs look terrible and I can kind of get a decent one going and then I can send it out like it was, oh, here's the right answer. Oh, look, this person got it. Well, it's really me, but that's okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So I use discussion board, especially in March, in a, a totally like non-traditional way as just for a way for students to post their work and other okay. students could see it. So then I started, um, like if the homework assignment had five questions, I would say post a picture of your solution to one of the five and hoping that somebody did all five would show up and then other students could check their work against that. I didn't really make them then respond to anyone. Um, and so, you know, I'm still trying to figure out like, how do I create a, a non-threatening way where they could go in and maybe comment on somebody's um, solution and say, oh, well, maybe you should have, or would, you know, and I haven't really developed that yet, but but I just really use it for a way for them to see each other's work. Um, and especially in um, math ed, yeah. I do that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I tried that in math ed in the summer also, and I didn't give solutions at all. And then they would, they would, and I would put comments occasionally and like they would have a wrong answer and someone would go, hey, that was a good way to think about it. And I'd be like, and so then I would say, maybe I should rethink this because I wasn't giving the answers to these and no one would comment them at all. And it was just, it was so disheartening. Like I would just get depressed every time I opened them because I'd be like, oh my God, they're really not thinking about this at all. Or I'd put in there, hey, did someone else do this any other way? Like this was an odd way of doing it. Nope, we all did it that way. I was like, no, I'm sure you didn't. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. So yeah, it can, it can be, uh, confirming their wrong answer yeah. um yeah but then i did a thing with my um transitional my developmental courses where um like you know those like pictures you see of like signs at walmart that have a mistake in them yeah. and that so i used that as a discussion board with them to just kind of talk to them about trying to find their own mistakes and again oh. I, I had like five or six different pictures and they could choose one of the one of the five to comment on. I thought that worked really well with them and kind of gave them some confidence because usually they could find the mistake. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to them in the next um, synchronous session about, you know, what, what they learned from that. So, so I don't, again, I didn't really have them commenting on each other's work, but it, it was a way to get them to interact. I realized I did have one successful time using discussion boards, but it wasn't with students. It was with faculty. It was like a, it was a, a summer workshop and everybody submitted like a problem from their textbook that they wanted to like open up, that they wanted to make like more inquiry based. And so I had a whole bunch of these questions. Then I picked five. I made a discussion board for each one and people then responded with like how they would open it up but I think it worked well because it wasn't just like one right answer, right? Like it was, there were a lot of ways that you could modify it. So I'm trying to think of like in my courses, if there's situations more analogous to that, where there's like really something that everybody can contribute something different to, because I think like if the question's too narrow, then it doesn't do that well on a discussion board. Someone either says one right answer or one wrong answer and they're like, oh, it's done, <laughs> you know? So I'm trying to think, like, I also teach math ed courses. I'm trying to think of, like, you know, I'd like to think many of my questions are very open-ended, but, like, there's still tons of wrong answers possible, too. Like, if there's more of, like, something that people can really authentically contribute to, I don't know. So that was that's, like, my one successful discussion board time. I thought that, I mean, it also could be the participants, right? Like, the faculty had such great ideas and were super engaged, and I don't know, you know, that's faculty over the summer not teaching at the same time. And that's really different than my students like overloaded with all kinds of stuff and courses during COVID all at the same time. Yeah. One thing that I've been doing is not a discussion board. Um, it's considered 
like part of my homework group, I create an assignment and it's, I call it like the daily problem. And all I do is mark it correct or incorrect is based on what we did in class. And it, they have unlimited amount of attempts to get it right. So it's kind of like a check for me to see, are they taking notes? And are, you know, are in the, I, I usually get them back to them within a day um, because it's quick feedback for me. And beginning of the semester went great. And now as the semester is going on and not as many students are doing it, but I feel like those who are doing it, it's helping maybe with those uh, misconceptions that they coming into class with. <laughs> Yeah, in all of this, like that's what it, you know, it's like about the student engagement. And so like when I brought up discussion boards, because that's the big talk. And I know at OCC, that was a big thing. Like you have to include discussion boards and it's not really the discussion board that needs to be included. It's the student engagement part that needs to be included. So I love hearing all these examples of, you know, like, like the Desmos activities or, you know, turn this in, look at someone else's, did they get right or wrong? Just ways to get students to think beyond their pencil and paper um, for that in any other ways that we have besides discussion boards <laughs> to do it, I think it'd be amazing. We had a, a little bit of success this semester. Now I have never heard of a discussion board until August, so <laughs> not in mine. Um, <laughs> But I, and I didn't come up with this idea. I think I got it from somebody, I don't know, some, somebody at our college. But what I did with a few of the discussion boards for my classes this semester was I gave them, for some of them I just assigned, so then they weren't doing the same problem. So for example, um, in my class, they just had one last week. They, we were working on graphing like sine and cosine functions. And there's a lot going on there when you've got the phase shift and all of this and labeling out the x-axis correctly. And so I assigned each of, and it was <laughs> to come up with so many that were roughly the same thing going on, you know, with the numbers. But I assigned them a function and then there, they had three parts to the post. The first part was they needed to follow the directions and write it all out. They could just upload a PDF to the discussion board, but they created their own it was set up so like they created their own post, each one created. And then the second part that was staggered a couple days later, they had to go in and, and look at somebody else's work and give them, there were specific questions of what I was grading that they needed to give them feedback on. And that's part of their grade is the checking. And I told them, we're, and it's not to be critical. I said, we're helping everybody to get 100% because part three is you get to go and redo it. And I only look at part three, actually. I don't even look at part one. But, um, you know, I said, so help your classmates. We're going to help everybody to get 100% this week. And they really liked that it was this sense of helping each other. And, um, you know, and if somebody was completely lost, they could go and look at other people's before they posted theirs. And it wasn't the same question, but it was, you know, the same, what was this, you know, different numbers, right? But it was, it, and it was something that was enough steps where there was really something different going on. Um, I think my algebra class, their last one like that was uh, solving a, an equation by completing the square, which is also challenging when those fractions get in there. And um, so they all had different fractions, but it all kind of, you know, worked out to be something, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so the, and I did it, the first time I did it, they were like, wait, what are we doing? When I told them we were doing a second one, some of the students during the synchronous class, when I said, oh, this is what we're doing this week. Some of them are like, oh yeah, I like this. I like helping each other. And, <laughs> and they like, they like getting the hundred percent too, right? If it's wrong, they, oh, thanks. I didn't even see that. And then they redo it and they get full credit. And the only hard part is like figuring out because part of their grade is the checking. Like if there was something and they didn't see it, if they just go, oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> then they lose credit if, you know, if there was mistakes. So they're supposed to, yeah. So like gave them a, like a checklist, like. This yeah. So there was things more. that they were supposed to respond to in their response. So they had a deadline and you need to check this, 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 and this, and that yeah. needs to be included in the response. Um, and they were like the things that I was grading for, you know, is this labeled correctly? Did they find the, you know, whatever it was, did they simplify like the that. radical or, you know, um, so yeah, it was, it was real specific of what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. But I think it also, you know, when you look at other people's work, it maybe helps you sometimes to learn better if you're trying to figure out 
if sure. theirs is right, you're like, wait, I think I have to actually do this problem to see if it's right or not. So um, it's almost like a peer review in a, in a, in a class that you would write a paper. That sounds pretty cool. It does. Yeah. And, and two of my classes have done really well with it. The third class there, uh, maybe I haven't chosen things that were tricky enough or I don't, I don't know, or they're not, they don't respond as much during class either. I think it's just the group of them. Could be the right. group. Like when you said that, Jennifer, that I was like, that would be the challenging part for me is like, I could find problems and modify them. So they're all close or whatever, yeah. but then the coming up with, Hey, I'm going to check for part A, B, C, and D. And for me to articulate that really well for someone else, that would be the challenging part for me for sure. Yeah. And they, and they're, and it's interesting. Some of them are better at it than others, but um, you know, and, and they can always ask me, you know, some of them ask me this week, they go, well, what if the person that said it, I don't think that they're right. I think I'm right still. And I go, well, you know, I said, I'll look at it if you email me and I'll let you know. If <laughs> So, th so that could come up, right? Where the, the person that's correcting is telling them the wrong thing, but um, it's, it's part of the learning at the end, you no, know, they're going to, th that person's going to lose points for telling them the wrong thing. But uh, at the end of the day, your part of your points is based on your correct submission. So, so did you write a rubric to go with it to make it easy for yourself to grade or not? N not like that formally. Um, okay. I, I not ahead of time. I end up when I go to grade it, but um, okay. what I've done is it's, it's usually just out of 15 and 11 is their post and four is the checking. Like it actually is like if they don't check somebody else's or if they just say, yeah, it's fine. And it's not fine. Th then it's minus four automatically. So that, you know, they can only get like a C on it if they, mm -hmm. um, are not doing the really helpful work to help their classmates and, okay. Um, yeah. And, and I do make that clear. So, and a lot of them very, very helpful feedback and, um, you know, and I tell them they have to reply, even if they don't find any mistakes, you have to reply. So I know that you looked at it and you did part three, right. you know, so say thank you for looking at my work or whatever. Um, or else I just deduct one point. Cause I say, well, I, I don't have any evidence that you did part three, that you even came back and bothered to look, um, at somebody else's comments. So. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but it's, From all of the, you know, I go to, I've been to a lot of webinars about discussion boards because I'm still not convinced I like them yet. And so I keep trying. And, um, like this was like the, one of the best things I've heard, John, for what yeah. you said about, especially for like the truly, um, symbol manipulating math types of problems that most classes have to do, right? Math ed and math lit and, quantitative reasoning and possibly even statistics, I get. Like I can figure out different things to do there because they're more touchy-feely. They're not as um, linear and ordered. Mm -hmm. But this, I was like, oh, that's like a really good one for the more traditional math sequence to get through calculus and beyond. Right, yeah. And especially for like whatever type of problem it is in that chapter that you know that's always the hard question that they struggle with. So right. we already know what that is in any specific chapter, so... So right. how many times do you do it in a semester or are you this semester? <laughs> like I said, I've never even done discussion boards before this no. semester. So, well, so I, I wouldn't go by me. I'm just kind of wondering realized, how many you came up with. I realized this semester that after a couple weeks in that in terms of my grade and, and I'm prepping everything, right? Like for right. all my classes, teaching sure. online is completely different. And, um, but uh, I, I discovered about uh, two or three weeks in, I need to limit myself to grading one item per week. So that might be a discussion board. It might be a quiz. It might be a project. We're not doubling up on these things during okay. the week. Right. Because uh, I, I, I've never been caught up with the grading. I'm not caught up now. I will be caught up by next week, Tuesday, because that's after the deadline. But uh, <laughs> right. Uh, right. But yeah, it's it, so it, yeah, it's, but I've liked some of those better than like, like the, this last one I just described, I did that instead of giving a quiz. Cause I thought yeah. maybe they would learn more from having to really sit down and work through it right? than just me grading the quiz and, yeah. and one and done. And that's it. They, like they're yeah. really focused on doing it. So, well, I, I've been giving collaborative quizzes during my synchronous sessions um, because they, you call it a quiz and they really want to work together. Let me tell you. <laughs> so the good thing about that is either they're usually really, really good, 
or there's been a couple times that I'm like, okay, you guys need to do this again. Cause, cause it, it, you didn't learn what I wanted you to learn. They think I'm being nice, but I really just want them to learn the concept. They're low stakes. It's not a lot of points. It doesn't matter. You call it a quiz and they will work really hard on it. So <laughs> kind of just- How do you split them up into groups? Is it random, random so, uh, subgroups or what? So no, um, I use a, um, a survey from uh, Trevor Muir who wrote the collaborative classroom. And um, I kind of tweak, like, I don't even know why he asked the questions that he asked for the projects, but uh, you can kind of be like, figure out pretty clearly, like who should be a leader, um, you know, cause they say, you know, that you, they rank themselves like, you know, the, some of the questions are like, you know, do you talk in class? Um, do you, are you good with, you know, cert, different certain things? And so then I really am just Frankenstein and I just match them together. <laughs> then I do mix them up again so that they can change. Now I do end the semester with their picking just like I would have when they were face to face. Um, uh, so, you know, some of the people gravitate toward each other. Some of them came back to the weird, the weird group that I had in the beginning, just based on Trevor's questions. Um, it just kind of depends on the class, but um, I keep them together for a whole like unit. So whatever you're going to have on your test, you guys all stick together. Um, I might not change as much next semester. I usually change about once a month just because people start to get to know each other and then they get off topic and you know, or you have somebody who's not working a lot. And um, I usually end up putting the people who don't work a lot together. Oops, did I just admit that? <laughs> because it's not fair to the other people, right? It's just not. Um, it's kind of a bummer, you know? Uh, that's when I hear all the complaints where so-and-so won't turn their camera on and so-and-so won't talk to me. And what I'm like, okay, we're done with so-and-so <laughs> you can next yeah. group. <laughs> next group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the student in face-to-face -face class that smells funny, you know, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're in the one group smelling funny the whole semester. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, you don't, don't know how many times I've heard, they won't turn their camera on when you put them in groups and unless you come in and then miraculously everything's on, right? Oh boy. And it, it has been the experience, you know, just with me that many students respond to, when they do respond to discussion boards at one hour prior, you know, just to the uh, yep. due date. And I do tell them at the beginning, you know, just what, of the week, that if you respond early, I read your responses and then I can provide, you know, feedback or even tweak my lesson if I see something, you know, just is not right there. And yet, you know, just uh, many of them decide, you know, uh, to, to post, you know, just within like one hour or two hours, you know, just before it's best to. And this Sam, is not just us. I've been reading, you know, just about issues with discussion boards. It's a na nationwide dilemma, you know. The students are students everywhere, you know. Right. Sam, have you never written a test the night before you were giving it? I mean, uh, we yeah, all do I it, did. right? Like I the did. deadline's the deadline. You know? I did, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I think that's the same thing, right? As, uh, you yeah, know. <laughs> I admit I did. Um, so Barbie, you said something that reminded me that um, we were actually mandated last year before any of this COVID stuff that um, all on all Canvas courses had to have a general discussion board where people could post questions. And in math, I just don't find that people, they won't go there for their, you know, I have a question on number two, they just don't do it. So, you know, <laughs> but we were also- you know, They did 10 years ago though, right? So 10 years ago, it was a good solution. It just doesn't seem to work anymore. I think you're right. They, they're going to go to an app. They're going to go to Symbol Lab, Wolfram Alpha, Desmo. They're going to do something else. Right. Yeah. Well, because they're stuck and they want to get unstuck now. They don't want to post mm -hmm. a question and then, oh, well, eventually when the instructor sees it and then responds, and then I go back and check, like, right. I'm working right now. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to get unstuck right, right now. And yeah. That's our technology today, right? Everything is so, yep. you know, immediate. Agreed. 
Yeah, it must have been like a like a an accreditation thing at some point for it to be mandated and have to be in there to show student engagement. And that was a really good way that they could someone could just take a snapshot of your LMS and say, oh, the students are engaged. But I think you're right. It's data technology. Like it's not how it's not how any of us, if I if I have a question right now, I Google it, I text Julie, you know, and right. I get an answer. I don't wait right. a long time to get, you know, send an email even and wait for that reply. So right. And students talk to each other on Discord. Right. So right. they do that in real time and they create all kinds of groups for my classes. Um, my it, students always have like a group me or a group chat of some kind. So like, I feel like their immediate questions, oftentimes they ask there yep. and I, I wish I knew what was going on in their group me's. It's mm -hmm. like, but they I get it before email. Like I, I announced some change over email and then one, the first person who gets it sends it out over the group me and then they all get it immediately. <laughs> I know. I told them I never want to know. So yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> but then like as a department chair, I've been in meetings with like one student will be the representative to talk to me about some complaint they have about another instructor. And the student is getting like their, their phone is blowing up. Oh, they want to make sure I tell you this. They want to make sure and I'm like, oh my God. So really you are representing like half the class. Yes. <laughs> okay. Like it is crazy. Yeah. But you're right. It's their way of communicating that we don't need to grade that, right? I mean, they have figured it out. And I don't know, yeah, accreditation wise, yeah, you're not going to see, but they have engagement. It's happening, you know? Right. Right. So, I mean, we, we've talked about discussion boards quite a lot. What are some other things you've, you've used this semester for student engagement? Like any apps or anything in particular that you've used? Julie, do you want to talk about Desmos activities? Like I've used them a little, but I haven't used them this semester. I used them in the summer. So, you know, just, I just really am using them as a student response system. So I've tried, um, I tried sharing Google Docs. I've tried sharing Jamboard. It's just not math friendly, right? And that's why I really have gone to Desmo so much because you can ask for math input and they can type it in just like they would type it in on the calculator. And it's not hard for them. They can communicate that. Um, even my math lit students yesterday were at the end of the of the book and right, we're doing some factoring, you know, the F word, and they could type in their expressions and they looked good, right? It doesn't look crappy like it like when they were trying to do it on Jamboard, they're trying to write. It was it was awful. It was awful. Um, so that does I abandoned that. That didn't work very well. And then trying to get them to show pictures is difficult. Like pictures, like you think it would be a simple thing to share a picture of your work and it's not, it's not on Jamboard. It's not in, in the Google slides. Like you, I've tried, I've even tried it in Desmos, which I don't think is that hard, but it seems to not work very well for them. Um, so being able to like type the math in is, is like super cool. Mm -hmm. For sure. I use, I use Jamboard a lot. It's for, for f courses for future teachers. And yeah. so it's not as much like writing out algebra. There is a lot of like drawing of diagrams. And so that's right. really important. They are frustrated by some of the limitations of Jamboard, but also like by now they're used to it. So I'm going to have the same students next semester for the next course. And we're not going to switch because like they're, they're comfortable with it now. But one other thing I've done when I don't need them to draw as much as I also will like put slides in my Google slides that they have to add to. Like maybe there's a prompt, like, you know, talk about this in groups and then there's, you know, whoever's the recorder is gonna write your summary in the Google slide. And sometimes I have, even though they're in breakout rooms, I have them all writing on the same slide. So it's again, that like eavesdropping on the table next door. Like yeah. they can, they can hear, um, you know, hear, they can see what other groups have written. So like there was one where I took a bunch of screenshots of problematic representations from their homework. Like they had represented fractions, adding fractions, and they had all different size pieces in ways that like were not good. And I had taken a bunch of screenshots of these. They all had like something good and they all had some drawbacks. And so I'd put those in the slides and all the groups had to kind of like critique those, um, those representations. And that worked really well in Google Slides. And like computationally, 
it's much easier for like Google Slides doesn't freeze as much. Like sometimes with Jamboard, people can have their computers are just like too slow to handle Jamboard. Mm -hmm. um, but Google Slides, having something where they all just go into the slides and like discuss things and write on the slides was nice. And then to talk about it afterwards, I can like, it's already in my slides. I can just flip through it. Yeah. So that worked really well for certain kinds of tasks. And uh, Nina, the frustration uh, with the Jamboard, is it because they're using their mouse and they don't have, you know, just a tablet and a stylus, you know, just pen or? Yeah, it's a few things. things. So one is, I thought it was frustration with the mouse, but most of them are using trackpads. Like it's actually okay to use with a mouse. Like I use, I use a mouse <laughs> and it's okay. Um, but they, they're using trackpads and it's harder. It's harder with a trackpad. Um, and I think like they want their diagrams to look really pretty and they want to have like, it also just has some stupid things. Like if you want to make a rectangle, you can't make it as skinny as you want. Like it's not as flexible as the drawing tools we're used to. So they like try to make a rectangle and you can't make a line. So you might make a rectangle like a line, but then it stops and it never becomes a line. And it's just, you know, they only added text boxes at the end of August. Like I used Jamboard all summer and all you had was stickies. You didn't have text boxes. But now you have text boxes, so that's a lot better. Um, it is it is relatively reliable, though. Like I've tried um, Scratchwork.io. I've tried a bunch of other like free collaborative whiteboards, and Jamboard was just it was the least buggy. I had other ones completely freeze on me with like four or five people in them. Um, so the Desmos, you can sketch on it as well. You can add that. Um, one of the other things that I like about the Desmos is that you can do starter screens and they have a lot of them made for you already. So I don't really even make them. Like, how are you doing today? So um, I even did that for my um, AMATIC webinar or, or wasn't a webinar. It was supposed to be the conference that we didn't get to go to. I guess it turned into a webinar, right? But um, just kind of like, how are you feeling today? Like, are you, are you negative, positive? Are you tired? Are you... Um, um, are you, do you have a lot of energy and it really, I do it at least once a week. And I just think it gives the students kind of like a little outlet. That's how I hear they have COVID or I hear that they're stressed out or cause otherwise I wouldn't know, right. Cause they're not, they're not sharing that verbally. They might be doing it in their small groups, but they're not doing it in the big, the big class. Um, unless I ask those kind of questions at the beginning of the week, usually on Monday and Tuesday, the first time I see them during the week, that's what I ask something like that. Um, for sure. I didn't in my teacher's class today and there's only um, 14 of them. So I can see them all on the screen. And I'm like, you guys all look tired. I didn't do a, a cause they just had a quiz today and they were kind of wrapping up for a, a test on Thursday. And I'm like, I didn't do um, a check-in and you guys just look, the looks on your faces. They're all tired. They start laughing. I'm like, they're like yes, we're tired. <laughs> Definitely. So I can at least see all of them and they, they are pretty good about turning their cameras on and communicating. Um, you know, the teacher students are anyway, so I get to see all of them. <laughs> I just want to make a comment about the weighting of the discussion boards. Although I made it, you know, just a little bit more, you know, this semester to 10 or 12, uh, uh, percent, I kind of feel, you know, just probably that wasn't, you know, just fair to do it this way for, the simple, for a simple reason. We assign homework and for each chapter, students would have to work, you know, 40 or 50 problems and with 13 chapters and the homework is no worth more than 12% of the grade. So I kind of feel like if we raise, you know, just a percentage, probably students will participate more, but I don't think it's right, you know, just to do it this way. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, I have that same problem in, like, again, I'm more, I haven't taught a traditional, like, algebra in a while. I've been in the math lit world. Um, but in those classes, like, I, 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 it drives me crazy when a student, like, squeaks by passes because of their homework grade, right? Because they're not ready for the next class, whatever it is, if they squeak by with just their homework grade that they're, you know, so I do, like, oh, they could have squeaked by and got a good grade because of their discussion board, like, it drives me crazy. Um, but I told, I get it and how it needs to be incentivized and all of that. But yeah, no, I'm with you, Sam. I can totally see like the, the balance of that in a math lit or quantitative reasoning. It makes sense. Like you want to get people engaged with math and seeing where they can use it and how these things can apply. 
I get it. <clears throat> but if you need them to know X, Y, and Z so they can get factoring, so they can go to these more complex things, and they, oh, I passed because I had really good discussion grades, then I'm like stressed out for the person who has them next. Michael, you were asking about engagement. Another engagement thing I thought about is like, just when I'm asking questions in class, it took me half a semester to figure out how to like have people raise their hands in Zoom effectively. But I just do an asterisk in the chat and I wait for there to be three. So I won't call on anybody till there's three asterisks. And sometimes the waiting is kind of painful, but um, I just had my students yesterday do a kind of a feedback fest jam board where I asked them a bunch of questions about how the class went and they typed in what they liked and several of them mentioned that they liked the asterisk method for calling on people because before the classes were small enough it would just be like yeah unmute yourself if you want to say something but then it's you know the same three people every time and so the the asterisks in the chat has been great and they specifically asked me to continue that next semester they said yeah keep doing that so that's been working well for getting people to answer questions. Yeah. I use Maria's uh, 321 in the chat all the time. Um, it really, Maria Anderson, it really works well when you have them just kind of load something. Now, it depends on if it's math, you can't have them type in a lot of math, right? But you could have them type in a value or a short phrase. Sometimes I give them letters like it, you know, is this, you know, geometric or whatever kind of series that it, we're talking about. But, um, and then they just type the letter in and then they all um, hit enter at the three, at the time when you count three down. And it works really well. It fills up the window. Um, and we kind of laugh about it, like sometimes because somebody's like, oh, I forgot I didn't hold it, like because they get so excited they hit enter. <laughs> but um, it's it's a it's actually kind of fun and it, it is kind of engaging, especially if I have to talk for a while and I want to see are they really with me or not. Um, I do have a really big monitor, so I do the thumbs up reactions a lot. Like you just are, are you guys OK? I can't see your faces. Um, even if you have your camera on, all the little squares are kind of little because there's 24 of you or whatever. I can't see all your reactions. So I can see the thumbs up pretty quickly. And my night class, they I crack them up a lot and they give me the, the guy who's like laughing so hard he's crying a lot, um, which just makes me kind of, it gets, gets me going more, right? And it just makes it crazier <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I do those, I do those three, two, ones a lot. I call, I call them chat floods, but I'll do them to like, when we introduce a new topic, again, this is math ed, but it's like, right. when you think of fractions, like what are the first words that come to mind? Right. Oh, yeah. And, and so just things like that to kind of get everybody started thinking, or like, what's everything you remember about the division algorithm or just, you know, right. And we do chat floods for that. And then, um, when I do number talks, um, cause like I try to model number talks for them. And so, you know, we'll do harder ones obviously than like a, an elementary classroom, but, um, in the participants panel, I'll say like, click the yes button. If you have one way of doing it, click the go faster button. If you have two or more ways of doing it. So then I can kind of see if people, how many solutions they have. And I can just, then I can just cold call people. I can like say, oh, <laughs> I'll choose someone who only had one solution. Then I know I can choose someone who had two solutions because I know that they'll have something additional to add. And so that was that was fun too, you know, because everybody, I see them turning green and blue in the little participants. Yeah, panel. so that's cool. Yeah, I'm writing that one down. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> that was good. When do your all semesters end? Like, are they, oh, like, do you have any classes left or? <laughs> okay. Uh, this, this week for LCC is finals week. Okay. So, and grades are due like next Tuesday or something. OCC's last day is the 21st. <gasps> so, yeah. <gasps> yep. Yeah, this week of classes, next week is final exam week for me. Yeah. Our last day is next Monday for classes that run on a Monday. And then final exam week starting Tuesday. I actually feel a lot better now than knowing that I'm actually finished before most of the state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, I mean, I, I mean, we're modeled after Michigan State. So is Michigan State finishing also next Monday or Monday? No, my son's got exams through his last one's Thursday. So I think Friday is the last 
next Friday is the last uh, day of, of finals week for him. Okay. Yeah. I know University of Michigan, my last day was yesterday, but the last day of classes is today, which is much earlier than we usually, not much, but at least a week earlier than we usually yeah. finish because we skipped, I don't know how it worked actually. We started earlier than usual. So that was probably related. Okay. And uh, I am aware, you know, that most, if not all community colleges are struggling with enrollment, you know, for next semester. Lisa, is it the same, uh, is, it the, the, is it the case, you know, just at the university as well? You know, I am not sure. Um, I have a department meeting tomorrow, so I'm assuming I'll get more numbers then. Um, I know my, all four of my classes are full that I'm teaching in the, in the winter. So, but who knows what everybody else is like, so. I know University of Michigan was surprised they thought fall enrollments would be low and they're actually higher than ever. Like they had much higher enrollments than they anticipated. Wow. Yeah, we surveyed our students, you know, uh, on the reason, you know, just, uh, we, we got a response. I mean, only 500 students, you know, just responded out of thousands. So I don't know of how good of a sample, you know, just would that be, but about 20% say that they're planning, you know, just to enroll, but they haven't done it yet. And uh, the rest of them, you know, just who responded said that they want to take, you know, just a break, you know, for a semester or so. Some of them are transferring, but, uh, you know, a good percentage says that they're planning, you know, just to do so. So we're hoping in the next, and it could be pretty much the case with other colleges as well, because, we're all, you know, just seeing, you know, just the same, almost percentage in the drop of enrollment. I don't know if you guys have done any surveys or you have some, uh, you can share some reasons of why students are not enrolling, you know, just at the same rate next semester. I think just from talking to students the last couple days, just they just have found it hard. Um, I just keep reminding them, you know, kind of like all the, the um, people tell us to give yourself a little bit of grace like we've never done this before our students haven't done this before either and they have uh, you know they they're they're frustrated because they're not learning the same way it doesn't mean that they can't learn this way they just have to adjust to it so it's really that power of yet right like you just haven't learned how to do this yet um and so some of them are frustrated because of that um I know one of the students I talked to today, I post, post a um, Friday, I call it Friday fuel. And it's just kind of like these like sayings or I make it, I, I look for the, the saying on, um, you know, a picture and I post that on the, on the, in the class every Friday. And um, the student said, you know, I said, I know I'm, I post those dorky things because you guys were struggling, right? And he goes, no, I love it that you do that, right? Like, I, I really like it that you, you know, try to, you realize that, that we are having a hard time and we do need a little bit of a, you know, let's come on, we can do this kind of, kind of uh, attitude. Um, so I remind him every Friday. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I, it just, I mean, I don't know, I know you guys are too, you know, you get the emails from students, I have COVID, I'm working retail, I'm stressed out, my family, the, the. so they're not mentally ready to sign up to do it again, right? So at some point, they might get a break, right? And, you know, right. Christmas will come or the holidays, whatever, things will relax, their COVID situation will change, and then they'll be like, oh, I'm ready to take classes again. But they're not going to sign up for that today when they're going to have to start paying money today. So that's where I keep thinking is we yeah. will get students coming back. It's just, they're not ready to commit to that right now. That's just, I'm hope that's my hope, I guess. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's probably true. Mm -hmm. I would imagine too, that some of them are taking fewer classes perhaps next semester. Just, they realize, you know what, when my kid's screaming and running through the house, uh, I can't do four classes and, and um, right. you know, so I, I think some of the decreases are not just students, but then the number of credits they're taking. And I know my students a few weeks ago, well, I don't even know how long it's been now since when the winter registration opened, it was sometime this semester. Um, they had before I had started class, they were kind of chatting with each other and asking, Oh, I've, I've got to take chemistry next semester. Is any did anybody find a chemistry class that has Zoom classes? Because so and so, my friend took it and it was called all online and it's way too hard. I don't want to do that. So 
I think they're also realizing they're more like informed about what the different types of options that are available and what maybe they want to do for their learning. And, you know, and, and some of them were actually, as they were talking and I, apparently we don't offer them at our college. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what science is doing, but um, you know, somebody had mentioned, well, well, U of M Dearborn has zoom classes for their, whatever science, I don't know if it was chemistry or whatever it was, but biology, but um yeah, so they're even shopping for maybe what they need to learn. And, and it, if we're not providing it, they might be finding it elsewhere. So it's kind of, you know, interesting discussion that I was just overhearing before class started. The same thing. Like I've, I've heard from a few students that they're taking four courses, four classes this semester. They just can't do it with, with all the work commitments and family family commitments. So they're only do two courses in the spring. I mean, luckily they chose math, but it, it, they're only going to do two. Yeah. And, I mean, I, th I think it's mostly because I'm teaching the next course in the sequence for them. But I mean, I guess that's nice to hear. But um, our math enrollment at LCC stayed relatively the same from from fall to fall. It's just the tech program took a huge, huge hit. Even, even though they're face-to-face, -face, they're just almost non-existent number of sections anymore. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, our skill trade, you know, just got uh, hit. And uh, in the social sciences, Jennifer as well, right? You know, just they're not doing well as far as enrollment. But I think math probably is kind of doing okay, you know, just with us. Now, my son has still got classes. <laughs> I don't know what LCC is huh. doing. Man. They say, so this says, this says that the classes ended last Thursday, which is crazy because it means there was half a week after the Thanksgiving break. All right. There was like two days. And then they say there's reading, there's reading period right now and finals start tomorrow mm. for MSU. It's a, it, so that's, that's what we're doing then. It's well, it's no, it's te technically it started today, Tuesday till Monday for us. Oh, is that a change from what you usually do? Like, we didn't change our schedule at all. It was, it, it's in our faculty contract what the schedule is, frankly. And so, uh, yeah, for years and years, it's already in there. I, I, it has to be, we started a week early, or it has to be. Or Michigan State, yeah. it's, it's Michigan State chose it first, and then LCC just did whatever. But yeah, I, I think it is a week earlier than normal. Do you have State fewer weeks? Oh. We How many 16, weeks do you have? Like we have weeks. fifteen plus one, you know, sixteen total. Hmm. Oh, I wonder if Michigan State has less. Like U University of Michigan, we have thirteen or fourteen. They're not fifteen or sixteen week semesters. Michigan State still has a spring break. Ours was canceled. Do you guys have spring breaks? Ours is canceled. We have it for now. <laughs> we're, we're Jennifer starting. said it's in our contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, it's just I, the students don't really go much places. It's the faculty that all leave. <laughs> but uh, I think we're going to be. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'll come back to my house if I go anywhere. I'm not planning on going anywhere at this point, but. I think that, I mean, we, we, we don't need a break to... though. I mean, That's I felt like... it this semester that it, when it got to like eight weeks in, I was just like, oh man, I'm really dragging. And I actually at the time said, you know what, next semester, it would be spring break right now. And I would get that mental break. And so, you know, I think we need it. The students need it. That's all I was going to say the same thing. Like I'm, I'm really thinking the eight week break will help everyone for the spring especially the students. Yeah. Cause like I mean, my previous, like my previous college while I was teaching in Kentucky, we had a fall break and a spring break. And mm. I always complained because it seemed like that was a, it was, a, it was supposed to be a recharger batteries, but it was like my, it was like for the students, it was a realization that my batteries were half and I'm not willing to go full 
for, for my students. Like they just stopped after eight weeks. So I'm wondering how would, how would Michigan do it if they didn't have a fall break? Well, it's, it's pretty much the same. It's just students, students are burnt out after eight weeks. So I'm hoping that spring break will have some benefit next semester. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. We'll see. I don't have you guys had any students like change location during the semester? Like mm -hmm. I've had I, I had one student in the middle of the semester. She sent me an email. And she goes, I'm probably going to miss class tomorrow because I'm traveling. And I'm like, oh, OK. She sends me an email the next day. Um, I can't open the homework. It says it's blocked in my country. I'm like, where did you go? <laughs> Wow. I, she, she's in Sierra Leone. I don't know. She's, she's like, well, that's where our, you know, my family is and I'm taking online classes. So yeah, I have another student that just last week is overseas now. And I don't know Wow. We'll how the semester yeah, finishes awesome. today. She couldn't upload something because they lost power and they were on a generator for, I'm like, uh, okay. How is this working that you've now moved to a place that doesn't have consistent electricity in the village where you're at. So I don't know how that's right. going to work, but. I just want to thank everyone for coming to the, for our sharing session. I mean, something, something for me, I, I take from every single one of these webinars is that everyone's doing fantastic, fantastic stuff around the state. Mm -hmm. And I'm just learning, even if I just learn one or two things, it's going to benefit, benefit my classes next semester. So I, I thank you all. I feel the same too. I'd yeah, always get you. something yeah. out of those sessions. Thank you guys. Thank so you. before you believe, like I was going to say that if you're interested next, like late next month, uh, like January, I think it's Julie's 20, is it January 29th? I think it's the Friday. I am saying yes. <laughs> so it's like the topic is interactive tools for virtual teaching. So you were cut off, Michael. What is it? Oh, I got cut off. So it's like interactive tools for virtual teaching. That's a, that's a great topic. Yeah. So it, it, John Oaks recommended this speaker from California. So I, I'm, she is very, very experienced in using interactive tools in her teaching. She's been teaching online for several years. So I'm very interested in hearing what she will have to share with us. <laughs> It is a Friday, so I'm, I'm, I think we had it scheduled starting at 2 o'clock Eastern. Okay. Yep. Yep. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah thank you guys for putting thank these you. on. Thank They're you, awesome. Michael. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you guys. Thank you. See, See you later.